Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I am your host, Chris Schmohan. Before we get into this week's episode, if you want to support this show and DIY independent comedy, you can donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash haha. For uh, starting at only $2 a month, you can help support DIY independent socially conscious stand-up comedy uh, and this show. So go to patreon.com slash haha to find out all the details, all the rewards, and all the goals that you will be supporting. All right, now let's dive into this week's episode. We start this week's episode with the Supreme Court, so this should be as light as a non-fat pumpkin spice latte without whipped cream and saying happy holidays to make sure you don't incur the wrath of the PC police. At current, the faith in the Supreme Court is shook like a shake weight without any of the fun sexual innuendos, but rather the very real sexual allegations. With the recent induction of Brett Kavanaugh into the Supreme Court, we have to wonder if the court can make a logical decision on issues dealing with immigrants, women, and anything that doesn't have to do with how much beer one can drink at a party. Okay, to get everybody up to speed, you know, just in case there's some folks unaware about what's going on or or any time travelers that might have landed into our decade... Brett Kavanaugh is the conservative judge that was accused of sexual assault by Dr. Ford, who recounted how he tried to rape her 36 years ago. This was brought up in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, only to be turned into a circus by everyone involved. During his defense, Kavanaugh was aggressive to senators, pushed conspiracy theories, and got defensive about the amount of beers he can drink. His biggest defense to prove his innocence was a calendar with a bunch of activities written on it. I mean, if this was going to be admissible evidence, a lot of criminals are going to get away with things by just buying a planner. See see here, Your Honor, okay? Uh, Right here it says that I plan on sitting alone in a dark room crying to myself about my failures. Okay, boom. That's innocence proved right there. I mean, why would someone write it on a calendar and not do it? That is a promise between you and and, and a box that is attributed to help us understand the passage of uh, of our lives through the endless void of space. Okay, you, you should not take that lightly. Eventually, the end to this came when Kavanaugh was inducted onto the Supreme Court, and now... The lives of two people have actively been ruined, which includes the inability of one man to admit that he could have done something wrong, apologize, and try to move on. And now we're, we're left wondering whether the highest court in the land can be logical, ethical, and make decisions that benefit the people. Well, Okay, realistically, after Citizens United, which granted corporations the ability to fund campaigns, we should have been asking this question anyway. Look, I'm just worried that Kavanaugh is going to freak out when Justice Ginsburg and Cagle disagree with him, right? He just starts screaming, you're a bitch, biter, okay? Don't ever question me or my rulings. I'm a big boy that drinks big beers. No questions asked. I wrote it in my calendar today that I'm going to win my cases, and my calendar's never been wrong. It got me this job. It's going to be a very sad day when a justice writes all his dissents in all caps. This administration is on a Game of Thrones level killing spree with institutions in place. The Supreme Court, presidency, civility, executive orders are all coming into question based on the actions of this administration. And we have to question the power and nature of executive orders themselves with Trump's recent attack on the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship. Recently, on an interview with Axios on HBO, President Donald J. Trump claimed that we should revoke birthright citizenship and undo some of the provisions in the 14th Amendment using an executive order. 
On immigration, some legal scholars believe you can get rid of birthright citizenship without changing the constitution. With an executive could... order. Exactly. Right. Okay, so what exactly is birthright citizenship? Basically means that if you're born in a country, you're a citizen of that country. Now, Trump claims that America is the only country that has this, and these kids are going to be suckling on the teats of the government for 85 years. Well, you can definitely do it with an act of Congress, but now they're saying I can do it just with an executive order. Now, how ridiculous. We're the only country in the world where a person comes in, has a baby, and the baby is essentially a citizen of the United States for 85 years with all of those benefits. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it has to end. Um, have you talked about that with counsel? Yeah, I have. So where in the process? It's in the process. It'll happen. Okay, first of all, what benefits are you talking about? Okay, if you are a mixed kid that's born in the States, you get to be an outcast of two different groups. Okay, you're constantly attacked by Americans that are bred by imperialist exceptionalism and and the culture of your ancestors, of, of the country that you came from, for not being ethnic enough. So where exactly are these benefits? I don't see a lot of parades for first-generation children of immigrants. You know, they don't get parades or free stickers or any kind of celebrations. They don't even have a month. Now, mostly because Brett Kavanaugh is now hoarding the rest of the 11 months on the calendar to prove his innocence of any other alleged crimes that he might have committed. You know, I, I really think we're like three steps away from the Supreme Court having to rule on whether or not a person can copyright dates on a calendar. Again, I, I have to ask, right, what benefits are these kids getting? Is it health care because people in this country can't afford the medicine that they need and are dying because the pharmaceutical industry is deregulated and price gouging for the sake of greed? I mean, if they really wanted health care, they would go to like Canada or Sweden or Denmark or the UK or Syria before American interventionism found it, like a stereotypical white girl sniffs out pumpkin spice for the holidays. I mean, seriously, American interventionism sniffs out countries that might be doing better than America, like a truffle pig. That's basically what it is. Is it, is it education? Because colleges are so expensive that we have to get two to three jobs just to survive the debt that we're getting from it, you know? And, and not only that, but because we don't and can't talk about the mental health effects of unfettered capitalism, children in dire straits are getting more desperate and more violent, and schools are turning into battlegrounds. And again, for American interventionism, this is great. You know, this is part of the... Uh, the, the truffles that American interventionism is the truffle pig that it is sniffs out and finds for itself, you know, more more soldiers for, 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 for taking over countries that we don't need to be in. So again, I have to ask, what benefits are these kids getting? And 85 years is an oddly specific number, okay? What happens to immigrants after 85 years, okay? What are you planning to do to them, Donnie? And we need answers, to the larger point, America isn't the only country that has birthright citizenship. It would be interesting if other nations were a bit more mature and realized that pledging allegiance to a nation creates issues of racial divide and unnecessary nationalism and borders aren't really necessary. Unless, of course, you're trying to assert your dominance via longitude and latitudes. Or it would just be like a bunch of countries shipping off kids into the sea because they didn't pass a test to be an uber patriot and had a few questions. I mean, it, it, does, does Trump really think that's how the rest of the world works? That there's some strange Lord of the Flies island that's like hidden to the eyes of nationalistic adults who don't have imagination in their hearts? I'm so fascinated by what he believes other countries do with their citizens. Or this is proof that he's got dementia and should seek help. There are actually over 30 countries that have birthright citizenship in place. Places like Canada, Brazil, Venezuela, Fiji, which, yes, 
is a real country and not just a stop on a cruise for obese rich people or water drank in unholy square bottles. Pakistan is also on this list. Pakistan, yeah, a country that most Trump supporters think is a sandbox, has birthright citizenship. Are, are you saying that America is less open-minded than Pakistan? Is that what we want to be known as? Less progressive than Pakistan? Okay, quick sidebar. I'm sure there's like some people that are not on board with this idea that we might be less progressive than Pakistan if we get rid of our birthright citizenship, right? The whole like, I don't care what kind of stand they're from. They're all a bunch of insert expletive here. You know, like that's, I know there's some people out there. Fine. If that's the case, if that's how you want to look at it, then, you know, it, but then I guess borders don't matter, right? Because all the countries in the Middle East are the same, same country. So I guess we can take a look at a state like Texas and say that's like North Mexico, right? And maybe maybe the city of San Diego is just Oceanside Tijuana. I mean, if that's how we're going to look at it, then then let's just do that. What's the problem with that? Okay, so what's the big deal with the 14th Amendment and why are we bringing this up now? Right? The 14th Amendment states that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, the reason why we have the 14th Amendment goes into the story of Dred Scott. Now, this may sound like a tall tale about a spacefaring pirate, but it's really the story of a former slave that was instrumental in rethinking civil rights. Scott was a, a slave in St. Louis who went up to Minnesota with his master. He found out that black people were free in Minnesota. They figured it was a little too cold up there to continue the chill of hatred based on skin color. You know, and besides, once there's like a foot of snow on the ground and the temperatures drop, everybody is one color. Blue. Minnesota had a rule that when you were in that state, everybody was free, so Dred Scott decided to stay there as a free man. He ended up meeting his wife, and then he married and started a, a family, and eventually he headed back to St. Louis where they were all considered slaves, and there was a chance that his family would be split up and sold off, so he sued. And then finally, they return to St. Louis, where they are still held as slaves. And by the early 1850s, I think they are concerned that um, they might be sold, that their family might be separated. Um, they are always at risk as enslaved people. And they begin what is, as you, as you explain, a series of freedom suits, um, a tireless effort to secure the freedom for themselves and for their two daughters. Um, these cases make their way through the Missouri state courts, um, and when they fail there, wind up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, there, Chief Justice Roger Tawney, um, now notoriously, pens an opinion um, that um, deprives the Scott family of pursuing their freedom claims in the federal court. Um, but as importantly, um, make sure that no African American enslaved or free can bring claims before these same high court venues. Eventually, you know, he took the case all the way up to the Supreme Court. He lost, and one of the judges at the time, Roger Taney, penned a letter claiming no black man should be able to bring a case like this to federal courts. Absolutely. Dred Scott is himself an enslaved man who is suing for his freedom. He's doing so in a federal court, and the question arises, does he have standing or the capacity to sue in a federal court, because only citizens can bring cases there. And the court concludes 
certainly that Dred Scott himself is not a citizen, he is a slave, um, but then goes further to declare that no black person, be they enslaved or free, can ever be a citizen of the United States. This is a devastating blow, as you can imagine, to free African Americans who have long uh, promoted the view that they are birthright citizens. But what's important to remember about Dred Scott is that its impact on the ground in the daily lives of African Americans is very limited. Very few courts are willing to enforce the literal terms of Dred Scott in um, the cases that they hear. Um, state legislatures are not uh, prepared to defer to the court's reasoning. And African Americans, even in the face of the dis devastating rhetoric in Dred Scott, continue to wage a campaign for citizenship into what then becomes the era of the Civil War. I'm sure you have found, as a historian teaching at a university, um, how little knowledge there is of history. And thanks to the 14th Amendment, no black person ever will, because it granted them citizenship and therefore the rights of a citizen of the nation. It was done by writing, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Dred Scott's case shone a light on the cracks, wrinkles, and warts on the face of the justice system. This is still an unresolved question, and the campaign to the 14th Amendment is precisely designed to respond to that long campaign that African Americans have uh, waged. It is to um, resolve um, the kinds of ambiguities, the kinds of dangers, the kinds of precarity that former slaves face without uh, resort to the status, their status as citizens. And so in 1868, um, after Congress has um, promulgated a 14th Amendment, the states will ratify it, and for the first time, the U.S. Constitution will provide that all persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States. It is a remedy, a radical remedy, to bring millions of former slaves into the body politic, but it is written in a way that gives it a lasting and enduring effect, which is to make every person, regardless of race, and I might say regardless of religion, regardless of descent, regardless of political affiliations, make every person born in the United States a citizen of the United States. I mean, you know, Lady Justice doesn't really know what she looks like because she has a blindfold over her face. And unfortunately, at this point, Lady Justice has been beer bonging out of depression since November 9th, 2016. The real issue most conservative lawmakers have with the 14th is in regards to undocumented immigrants. They claim that the case, they make a case for the fact that the amendment is for legally documented immigrants and green card holders. What I think the president's made clear is that we are looking at action that would reconsider birthright citizenship. We all know what the 14th amendment says. We all cherish the language of the 14th amendment. But the Supreme Court of the United States has never ruled on whether or not the language of the 14th Amendment, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, applies specifically to people who are in the country illegally. That's the Vice President of the United States. Professor Jones, can you respond to what he's saying? I can. Um, I think with a word of caution, Amy, um, Vice President Pence is, I think, attempting to distinguish the facts um, in our present day of a family of unauthorized immigrants who give birth to a child in the United States. Which leads us to the age-old anchor baby argument. If you don't know what the anchor baby argument is, it's an amazing fear-mongering technique that Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and various members of the Republican leadership have used where two immigrants have, a, have unholy, ungodly, unprotected sex. Then they get knocked up and cross the border and have a baby on American soil spilling Mexican placenta everywhere. Then the child becomes a citizen and is a sleeper agent for Mexico uh, who is trying to dominate all of the jobs in America. Then the placenta creates more Mexicans from American soil dirt and then deports an American citizen to, let's say, I don't know, Cuba. It is diabolical. 
But that is the fear, right? There are over 11 million undocumented people in this country that came into the States. A lot of them work menial jobs that nobody wants for almost nothing. But those could be Americans working those jobs. I mean, those could be poor Americans the elites can enslave through wage theft. Okay, and and a lot of those people have kids, and and the and the Republicans want to split up these families. Okay, and all of a sudden the world is yelling about like civil rights, and all the Republicans wanted to do is correct what Abraham Lincoln fucked up and trick the people into a new form of slavery. Trump's statements are about revoking the Fourteenth Amendment altogether using an executive order. He wants to retcon. An amendment, which, look, is going to screw up the numbering system of the Constitution, and this isn't going to do us any favors for the relationship between America and math. Okay, America's already on thin ice with its refusal to use the metric system. Trump wants to get rid of the amendment using an executive order, and now King Republican and champion of all blind corn eating contests, Paul Ryan, has said that he disagrees with the president because he is a defender of the Constitution. You obviously cannot do that. Uh, you cannot end birthright citizenship with an executive order. As a conservative, I'm a believer in following the plain text of the Constitution, and I think in this case the 14th Amendment's pretty clear. Which goes to show that Paul Ryan is a stronger defender of a piece of paper than he is a piece of human and civil rights that the paper grants. But he does bring up a very good question about whether the president can undo an amendment using an executive order. Now, we have to look at what exactly an executive order is. This is a directive from the president that tells the federal government how to act and is directed as a law. And this has been incredibly controversial as it's supposed to be used when presidents can't get a piece of legislation passed by Congress and are forced to use it to pass legislation. But in turn, it makes them look dictatorial. And the language uh, of the constitutional clause that grants presidents this power is vague at best. But executive orders can't go against constitutional rulings like amendments. The Founding Fathers are super guilty of, like, their version of vague booking, you know? It's like vague governing is basically what they did. Some of the more famous executive orders include Obama's DACA order, FDR's order to put Japanese in internment camps, uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and the lesser-known fact about Lyndon B. Johnson's order to push for pantsless weekdays at the White House. Now, he didn't get that through because it was deemed unconstitutional. And at this point, uh, at the point that I am recording this video, Trump has only used 87 executive orders in two years. Most modern presidents have over 200, like Woodrow Wilson, who has a little over 1,800 executive orders. And I know, I know, it's early yet, right? If he breaks FDR's record of over 3,000 in the next year, we can all give him a medal that says this is not how you win a father's love. Now, based on the very nature of executive orders, the Trump administration can't use that power to undo an amendment because demolishing the Constitution is the definition of unconstitutional. And I shouldn't have to say that sentence out loud, but you know, logic seems to be a, a privilege in today's political climate, so I share my privilege with the world. One of the ways that you can fight back against an executive order is via Congress and the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually revoked five of FDR's uh, executive orders, and Congress has definitely pushed back against Obama's DACA order. Now, there is a nightlight somewhere in this tunnel. We're, we're, we're just not sure where it is. But these are also two institutions whose legitimacy has come into question recently. As much as Paul Ryan likes to show how tough he is by how many push-ups he can do or how well he can fuck over the uh, poor America, you know, he hasn't taken any initiative 
to confront Trump on his rulings. And with two Trump loyalists in the Supreme Court that abide by what he wants, if something leads to amendments being erased by an executive order, the authoritarian cracks will break through. Now, the argument of birthright is really about undocumented immigrants. And the simple answer to me is clear the slate. Get it back to zero by offering these folks amnesty and allowing them to go through the process to get their green card and so on, right? They're already here. And the system they would have had to go through is so complex and so broken and lacks so much compassion that they did whatever they had to to make sure that they can come here. If there are over 11 million people that came into your country illegally, Don't you think the question should be why they would do that? What's wrong with the process that they can't trust a country to take in migrants that are in trouble or people that want to have a better life and contribute to a country that can allow them to get bigger, better opportunities like the country advertises? I mean, the real issue with the downfall of these institutions is that they're not going down without a fight. This executive order has exposed another boil in a body riddled with cancer, and it's using immigrants as a scapegoat to keep itself alive. Perhaps by digging deeper, we'll reveal more answers about a history this country is trying to forget. By the way, forgetting was an executive order that George W. Bush put forward by making it the actions of past presidents unavailable to the public. This country has been beer bonging its history since the declaration was written. So it's not really a surprise that the institutions that held it in place are now coming into question. And neither is it a surprise that we put a big boy drinking big beers in the highest court of the land. That's been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and a share. Share it with some friends. Share it with some enemies. Anybody that you think would benefit from hearing uh, hearing stuff like this. Um, And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at at Haha. Also on Instagram, like my Facebook page. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, And if you enjoyed this content... Uh, you can become a patron for only $2 a month. Go to patreon.com slash krishmohan, ha ha. Uh, I put out this show for free every single week. Uh, and to produce a show like this, it's very difficult. Uh, I do all the research, the writing, the the video recording, the e- editing of the video and the audio. Um, I'm the only staff member uh, for a show that takes a lot to produce. Uh, usually shows like these have a writing staff and a research staff and video editors and audio editors and things like that. And all of that is being done by me. And I'm putting this out for free for you guys because I think this is information that everybody should have available to them. Uh, and it's content that everybody should uh, it should have available for free. But if you enjoy it and have the means to donate and can donate, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, and, uh, and contribute whatever you can there. Like I said, uh, it all starts at $2 a month. Uh, and you get uh, you get fun, exclusive um, early access videos. You get uh, exclusive stand-up comedy content as well from me. So consider donating. Uh, go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, But I have live stand-up comedy shows coming up. I am going to be coming to Greenville, South Carolina, uh, Augusta, Georgia, Asheville, North Carolina, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Columbus, Ohio, and Elyria, Ohio. I've also got dates coming up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and all across the country. You can check out all of my dates at ramennoodlescomedy.com. I've got a bunch of tours coming up in 2019 that I am very excited about, and I'm going to be recording my next stand-up comedy album, Empathy on Sale, at various different cities uh, in January and February of 2019. Uh, The dates for that are currently uh, January 24th at a house show in Huntsville, Alabama, produced by Clockwork Comedy, uh, January 26th at Stage 18 in Fayetteville, Arkansas, February 1st 
at the Fun House in Mr. Smalls in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and on February 7th, uh, February 2nd, uh, at the Harrisburg Improv Theater. The details for all of my dates are available on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check out uh, all of my blog posts that are up there. I occasionally write about sociopolitical issues that I don't get to make videos about quite often. Um, I share stories from the road. I share uh, opinions about comedy. Uh, my tour dates are on there. Uh, my podcasts are on there. It's a one-stop shop to get everything Krish Mohan that you would like to. Uh, you can download my stand-up comedy albums there as well. Um, so it's a, it's a one-stop shop for that. Um, I'm going to be doing um, a lot more of these these sort of shorter uh, shorter episodes um, in, instead of the, the deeper multi-part explorations. I will be doing more of those. I've got a couple of those planned, uh, but like I said, those take a lot of work to do. Um, so if you if you enjoy these episodes, uh, please do give them a share. Please do give them a like, um, and uh, and come hang out with me if I'm coming to your city. Uh, and leave a comment below about uh, any thoughts that you have. And thank you guys so much. Uh, a, a lot of you guys have already become patrons of the show, and uh, it means a lot. It helps a lot. Every little bit helps. Every little bit helps the show grow and get bigger and get better. Um, so thank you guys for uh, for contributing to the show. Thank you guys for watching, and uh, we'll see you on the road. <laughs>